Hi, this is Josh Kulp. We are learning uh, Masechet Kiddushin. We are on Daf uh, Yud, Masechet Kiddushin, page 10. Um, and this page, uh, first of all, a like warning if you are under the age of, uh, I don't know, 18, 17, whatever the age is now, this, we will be ta- this uh, video will talk a little bit about sex, so beware. If your child is listening, you might want to take that under consideration. Um, so the, the, the sugi continues to talk about um, kiddushin done through sex. And I want to reiterate that this seems to be a theory of the Mishnah and the rabbis that I don't really believe was ever practiced in normal um, ways that marriage was done. Betrothal was done through money or an object. The man gives the woman a, um, a piece of money or something of value, and that's a way of sort of signing on that they are officially engaged, um, the same way that we use the word, a promise to get married at a time in the future, um, and that she would go to live with him later on after um, a certain ter- period of time had elapsed, and she would move into his house. That's not to say that that uh, couples never engaged in sexual relations while they were engaged. Indeed, there is talk about that in the Talmud. But the ideal of Kedushin is that it's done through money, and later on, the couple goes and lives together and has sex then. And just like we use the word, they use the word, they would consummate the marriage. But the Mishnah comes up with the idea that Kedushin can be done through uh, sexual relations as well, which means both betrothal and perhaps later on marriage would also be done through um, through sexual relations. Now, um, the first, there are really two sugiyot on this page. The first one is an interesting theoretical question I find, I don't know, fascinating, whether the beginning of sex is what creates Kedushin or the conclusion of sex. And I believe that this refers to a male conclusion of sex. Um, It's an interesting theoretical question. Uh, Does it count as having sex if you have sex, but the male does not come to climax? I mean, I think that many people would say, yes, it's the male's problem. If he didn't come to climax, so be it. If you're cheating on your spouse and you say, well, sorry, uh, Honey, I, you know, I, yes, I had intercourse, but I didn't come to climax, so it's not such a big deal. I don't think that argument's going to fly too well. I wouldn't want to try that out at home. But it's still a theoretical question of, like, what does it mean to have intercourse? Does it mean just some kind of physical beginning of contact, or does it mean completion? Of contact. I don't need to get more explicit than that, I suppose. Um, the second question is really, I think, a very, very interesting question, and it relates to a topic that I'm writing about in a forthcoming book um, about whether or not sexual relations creates um, betrothal or marriage. And along with this question comes up um, something that's a central question in rabbinic discussions of Kiddushin, and that is how strong of a bond does betrothal, does kedushin create? Um, so let me say a few words about that for the rest of this video. First of all, when rabbis want to illustrate how strong a bond kedushin creates, they do that through the use of truma. We'll see this a lot, that if a woman is really, let's say, fully bonded, attached connected to her husband's home, then if he is a priest, a Kohen, she can eat truma. If she's not fully connected, 100% deal right to from the Torah, then she can't eat truma. We can just always be more strict. But the way to say, to, the way the rabbis will express that Kedushin creates a very strong bond is to allow her to eat truma. Now, all Tanaitic sources assume that in reality, as far as when an actual a woman does begin to eat chuma, almost all sources just simply assume that that doesn't happen until chupa, until she moves into him. In other words, when they're talking in a practical reality, Tanaitic sources assume that um, uh, uh, chuma, that the bond really happens at marriage. But when they begin to talk about the theory of it, there are a lot of sources that say in theory a woman can begin to eat truma at an earlier time, when she's betrothed. And this brings betrothal in line with other sources that talk about other issues, such as 
um, does it count as adultery? So according to rabbinic law and according to Torahitic law as well, a woman who cheats on her husband by sex with another man while she's betrothed to her husband is an adulteress, as is the man who has sex with her. So betrothal is an important point that defines adultery, and, and, and consequentially, a woman who wants to sever that relation, need, relationship needs a full divorce. Again, just not like today when you get engaged, you don't need a divorce to break off an engagement. You do need a divorce to break off a marriage. For the rabbis, you need a divorce to break off engagement. So this is really the controversy that comes up in a fascinating brighta in the sugi. It's an argument between um, somebody named Rabbi Yehuda ben Batera who lives in Nitzivin, which is in modern Syria. In other words, it's outside of the land of Israel. And another sage who's living in the land of Israel named Ben Bagbag. And they're really arguing about the nature of betrothal. Um, it's a complicated subject. Sources are not uniform on this. For the most part, rabbinic law considers betrothal to be extraordinarily strong. In other words, it's essentially marriage without living together, with all of the obligations of uh, consequences of adultery and eating a get and potentially eating truma, although not reality, um, are all there at um, the point of betrothal. But when we start looking at actual stories in rabbinic texts, we see that people don't seem to have behaved always in such a manner, and that in in, in popular behavior, it seems that they acted more like we do than consider betrothal a promise to get married, but marriage really is the full consummation of the legal consequences of marriage. Uh, you can find a lot of information about this in uh, an interesting book that came out maybe 10, 15 years ago by Michael Satlow called Jewish Marriage in Antiquity. He spends the entire first chapter, if I remember correctly, talking about this issue. Um, and hopefully I will uh, you'll read my forthcoming second volume of Reconstructing the Talmud, where I talk about it as well.